Hey, Ecclesia, and let me share with you uh, a Merry Christmas. Uh, this is a great time. December has started. We're in the season of Advent. One of the things that I loved about the previous week that we all shared together is that it was Thanksgiving week, which meant that my oldest daughter was home from college. And that's always a great time. Those of you who have had kids who've gone to college or gone off to work, maybe you've got grandkids that come back. There's just something special about having all of the family under one roof. And so we did what many of you probably did during that time. We talked about what we wanted our Christmas to look like. And sometimes that's a pretty short conversation because we have traditions, things that we do every year that just fit the rhythm of our life. And part of that is also making Christmas lists for the gifts that we're gonna exchange with one another. And I like to be very clear. I've always been very clear about what I like, what I don't like. The reality is, and I don't think I'm alone in this in terms of dads and husbands, is like, if we want something during the year, we typically go buy it. And whatever I would ask of any of my kids, like they can't afford to get me. So my list is usually pretty small. And for me, I just want us all to be together, having a good time together, eating great food together, just being in one another's presence. But the girls... They make a list. And our youngest daughter, Catherine, made out her list. And she actually put it in an Excel spreadsheet and sent it to us on email. But it wasn't the list that really got me. It was the tab across the top. She says, Kay's Christmas list 2022. And then she added the words, no edits which meant like this is exactly what she wanted. Like, don't get creative, don't add, don't take away. And she had some stuff on that list that quite honestly was pretty pricey. And as she's going through her list, sitting around the living room with all of the family, my wife and I look at each other like, this child is insane. And it's not that she's insane because she had a Christmas list. Plenty of people do that. But it's like that she had forgotten that just the week before, we had bought for her and her friends tickets to see Taylor Swift. Some of you have heard about the ordeal with Ticketmaster and Taylor Swift. I was online all day. Two, three weeks ahead of that, I had to go online and get a code so I could just be in line. And there was a line to get a code to be in line. I had to be in line to be in line. And then that whole thing was a fiasco. I was online in front of my computer with that tab open all day. And I don't know if you know this about Taylor Swift. Those tickets were not cheap. She's the biggest music artist in the world right now. The week that I bought those tickets, she had the entire top 10 list. Every song on the top 10 was a Taylor Swift song. And we bought tickets. And so I was online, our oldest daughter was online, and we ended up with 10 Taylor Swift tickets. And do you know what it means when you have 10 Taylor Swift tickets? Here's what it means. You just made a lot of new friends. Not only that, you just heard from a lot of old friends who they were in line and it just wasn't, they weren't as lucky as you. And so we've got these 10 tickets and we spent a pretty penny. I'm actually embarrassed by how much money we spent for Taylor Swift tickets. And the only solace that I have is that we're going to make that money back and then probably some more selling Taylor Swift tickets. So my wife looks at Catherine and says, you already got your Christmas gift. Matter of fact, you got your Christmas gift, you got your birthday gift, you got treats for Valentine's Day and Easter, you got gifts for Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and stuff that we don't even celebrate because we bought those tickets. It's so weird, the world that we live in. And nothing is more revelatory of that then when we come to Advent and the way Ecclesia we hold Advent and enter into this season, and for decades now, we have practiced Advent conspiracy where we talked about living a different way in Advent. 
And so last week we talked about worshiping fully and what that might look like. And this week we're going to talk about spending less. And that's a hard topic to talk about when you just dumped a bunch on Taylor Swift tickets for Christmas. And my gift in buying those tickets was just time with my girls. But of all of the tenets, worship fully, spend less, give more, love all, I think spending less is the hardest one to wrap our minds around. Because what does that even mean to spend less? I just told you the story a couple of years ago when my wife was working for an adoption agency. She was working with this family and the husband in this family earned $400,000 per year. And for many of us, that's a lot of money, more money than we can imagine earning in a year. And for others of us, that's maybe a down year. But what was interesting about this family is as they were going over the finances, which you have to do in an adoption process, my wife discovered that they spent Three months of the next year, after having earned $400,000, they spent three months of the next year paying off Christmas. That's a lot of spending. But spending is really nebulous. Because what does it mean for you to spend less? Less than who? Less than what? Less than last year or five years ago? You've got inflation to consider. Like For one family, they could spend $5,000 or $10,000 on Christmas gifts this year or Christmas trips. And that would be less than they spent last year. And for others, they'd spend five or 10,000 and that's more than they would ever spend. I think about this every time there's Black Friday. Several years ago, folks were going to Black Friday sales, buying these huge televisions that were on sale. And many of them were mocked because they got into fights in Walmart and other places. And for some people, trying to hit a Black Friday sale and getting violent with someone else over Black Friday sale, Like, that's ridiculous. And there are other people that the only time that they're going to be able to buy a new TV is when it's on sale. I think spending is one of those topics that we have to be really discerning and careful about when we talk about what other people should do. And what's fascinating to me about that is there's not a lot in the scriptures about spending. I mean, you don't have to read Greek and Hebrew. You can just read English and just look up, what's the Bible say about spending? And most of the text in the New Testament and the Old Testament don't talk about spending. They have different words for what we're trying to drive at during Advent. They use words like covetousness or greed. That's how the scriptures talk about Spending. And it's one of those places, it's a topic that in the text that we have to be careful about. Because one, I've never met a single person in the history of my life who thought that they were greedy, but every person that I've ever met has a keen eye for when other people are greedy. But I think deep down, we all know that we are covetous people, that we can be greedy people. That's why early on in the story of God's community, he says, thou shalt not covet. And that's so often what we spend our time and energy, our focus on. So I want to share with you just a couple of stories from the scriptures about what God is asking us to do with the energy of our life. Because if you just live in our culture, the word you get is that the energy of your life should be focused on earning enough or having enough or owning enough to consume. And that's not what the scriptures invite us into. And one of these is this small story from Acts, from Acts 9. And Luke tells us this story. He says, now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At the time she became ill and died. When they had washed her and laid her in the room upstairs, since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there 
sent two men to him with a request. Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Well, there's a ton going on in that story. And you might remember, Ecclesia, that there's a certain characterization all throughout the scriptures that needs to come to your mind, a certain image that should pop in your mind when you hear, when you read the word widows. And there's this woman, Tabitha. And she is described as a disciple. And first of all, you need to know that the word disciple comes up nearly 200 times in the New Testament. There's only one time that the female version of the word disciple comes up. And it's Tabitha. Like women in the New Testament are leaders. They are house church leaders. They are servants. They are deacons. But only one is described as a disciple. And what do we find out right after we discover that she is a disciple? That she is devoted to good works and acts of charity. And who is the receiver of those good works? The widows. As a matter of fact, when Peter shows up, they don't start talking about what Tabitha did for a living, how much she earned. They just start showing, showing Peter these tunics and garments that Tabitha made. And there's some scholars believe that Tabitha was a wealthy single woman. And this is what she did with her time. She used the energy of her life to give to these women. Women that were easily overlooked, even in the New Testament church. The disciples are doing all of this stuff and they go, oh, we've got to make special preparation for the widows and for the Gentile widows. This is how she used the essence of her life. And Peter comes up and says, Tabitha, arise, get up. And that's a little inside joke for all of us Bible nerds. Because way back in Mark 5, Jesus is called to the house of a man named Jairus. And Jairus' daughter has died. And Jesus walks in and he says to her, get up. Where Peter says, Tabitha, arise. Literally in the Aramaic, Tabitha, kumi. Jesus says to Jairus' daughter, Talitha, kumi. It's a word that just means little girl or beloved one. Rise up. And Peter is drawing us all the way back to the healing in Mark 5, where Jesus likewise raised a young woman from the dead, this dear child. And when Jesus performs this miracle in Mark 5, the greater context of what Mark is talking about in Mark 5 is where you store your treasure. This little story about Tabitha, or maybe you grew up hearing about her as Dorcas, is about where you store your treasure. And Jesus, over and over again, says where you store your treasure is about where you spend the energy of your life. When we talk about spending less, 
what we're talking about is what you're spending. And the greater community around us, the greater culture around us, they want you to spend money. It'll be about the economy or giving gifts that someone will appreciate or filling some own need. Matter of fact, if you look at the research, most of the money that Americans spend on Christmas during this Christmas season actually isn't for gifts. We spend most of our money on ourselves. We buy that thing that's finally on sale that we've been wanting all year. And the scriptures invite us to a world where the energy of our lives, where what is spent, is spent from us for others. And if the scholars are right, and Tabitha is a wealthy young woman, she could have paid somebody. She could have found some garments. But the scriptures tell us that she made them. And when Peter shows up, these widows surround Peter with these tunics and these garments. Because that's what Tabitha spent her life doing. And so what I want to invite us into is maybe we do need to spend less in that world, in the world of consumerism and product, and spend more from ourselves for others. Vanna Bota is a writer and she says, greed, greed is the lack of confidence of one's ability to create. And what I want to invite us into is a season of creation together. And these two things are so often at odds, consumerism and creation. And just like the God who made you, you are made to create. So maybe spend less online and more with people. Ecclesia, let me pray for you. God, show us a way to spend the energy of our lives well. That we would shepherd the gifts that you've given us. That we would go against the grain of greed. And we would step into a life of giving. That we would see someone like Tabitha and know that you look on to us and our creation of good for other people and see us as your beloved. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.